Um, hi, everybody. Assalamu uh, alaikum. My name is Afaf Osman. I'm an oncologist and I'm a board member of the Sudanese American Medical Association, also known as TAMA. Today, we are celebrating International Women's Day, which was on March 6th. And we're celebrating this day by honoring a very inspirational woman, um, Mama Iqbal, who is a midwife uh, who worked very hard to end female genital mutilation in Tuti Island. Uh, we also have multiple panelists today. Uh, one of the main themes for the day that we will be talking about extensively is female genital mutilation, uh, which unfortunately is a practice that continues to be prevalent in Sudan and neighboring countries and um, is a very harmful and detrimental practice to women. Moderating this panel with me is Dr. Ellen Grinbaum, who is a cultural anthropologist specializing in women's health. We also have um, Samira Amin, um, and we have um, uh, Krista Johnson and Dr. Yusra Abdel Mahjoub. Uh, we will introduce the panelists uh, in more depth uh, a little bit later. Um, initially, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how Sama supports women in Sudan. And specifically, I wanted to mention our gender-based violence program in Sudan. So unfortunately, Sudanese women are subject to multiple uh, social and uh, health and psychological mm -hmm. problems. Uh, gender-based violence is a huge problem in Sudan due to the history of the, of the country and, and the multiple conflicts that happened over the years. Uh, we have partnered with the Ahfad Trauma Center um, to give two seminars focused on gender-based violence in high schools in Sudan. Ahfad Trauma Center is the first and only free mental health therapeutic community service, and it's located the, at the Ahfad University for Women um, in Khartoum. Um, and its mission is to counsel families, individuals, and communities recovering from all forms of trauma. Uh, by using culturally sensitive therapeutic approaches through a multidisciplinary team, including child trauma counselors, adolescent therapies, therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, and group therapies. Um, so we partnered with the Ahfad Trauma Center um, and we uh, presented two um, seminars in two high schools in Sudan. Um, and that was last year, or actually was in, in 2019. Um, and this was part of the global gender-based violence campaign, uh, 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Um, and we are planning um, to do a three-year program um, against gender-based violence and expand this effort um, to different schools across Sudan, uh, because this was only in Khartoum. So we hope to be able to um, do a similar a seminar and program to schools outside Khartoum as well. Um, these seminars will focus on multiple uh, women associated issues, but will also focus on female genital mutilation with the idea of um, raising awareness within the students um, and between the students and their peers about uh, female genital mutilation so that they are empowered to say no to female genital mutilation and so that they can spread this awareness between their peers um, and colleagues. So we hope to expand this program, but of course, you know, we are a donation-based organization. Um, so we urge you and we um, ask that you donate to our organization so that we can expand these programs um, and build on them and have a, a bigger reach um, in Sudan. Um, so I wanted to introduce Dr. Ellen Grimbaum and then um, she will introduce the rest of our panelists. Um, so she is a cultural anthropologist specializing in women's health. She studied Sudanese women's health issues for four decades starting during four years at the University of Khartoum in the 1970s, and she published The Female Circumcision Controversy, an Anthropological Perspective uh, at the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2001, based on her research. She has served as professor and head of the Department of Anthropology at Purdue University, 
as a member of the American Anthropological Association's Committee for Human Rights, as a researcher consultant for UNICEF in Sudan and in Sierra Leone, she began as a speaker and author. Her current project focuses on the process of change of FGC practices in Sudan. Um, so Dr. Grimbaum, we can go ahead. Thank you very much, Afaf. It's a very it's a pleasure to be here. Last month we had we featured speakers who had extensive experience in research and social services, in uh, especially in Sudan and the UK. Um, and today we're going to take that a step further and hear from speakers who have engaged in very practical ways, both in Sudan and in the United States, in trying to improve the lives of women and girls affected by female genital mutilation or cutting. Um, and we, we want to look where there are people who are involved in bringing the practices to an end, and there are people who are working with the consequences of uh, life after having had female genital cutting. Our, it's a very packed day. We will have uh, Samira Amin Ahmed, we will have Krista Johnson Agbaku, we will hear from um, from Iqbal Abbas, it's going to be, and we will also have a brief commentary by, by Yusra Matjoub. So we need to get started. Our first speaker will be um, Samira Amin Ahmed. She holds a master's of science degree and a PhD in social anthropology and sociology. Her, um, she's been working for more than 30 years on development issues and mostly in Sudan. <laughs> and she's been teaching and working in development programs in different sectors. I first met Samira um, back at the University of Khartoum, but we later worked together on a project in 2004 and we've seen each other many times since then. She's worked with government, with NGOs, with international agencies, and including the United Nations. And her work in communications for development has, has been a really important aspect of her work. Um, she's the founder of National Communication Initiative for Abandonment of Female Genital Mutilation and Cutting. And um, she's also been very, very involved in what's known as the Salima Communication Initiative. That's part of that. Currently, she's working on the design of a new national campaign to abandon child marriage and is collaborating with UNICEF and the National Council for Child Welfare in Sudan, which is a government counterpart to UNICEF. Uh, she's also worked extensively with national and international NGOs in the field of development and advocacy for legislative reform and concerning the rights of women and children. We talked about laws a little bit last week and she's been very key in working on those issues as well. She's also worked to improve HIV AIDS communication strategies and develop dialogues for protection and negotiation of rights and tools and materials and face-to-face -face communication in the public sector. So she's got a lot of different um, hats or hijabs that she wears. Um, she developed roadmaps that are now widely used for organizing community dialogues. And I think she, we'll find out a little bit more about that today. Um, she's did a very important work of trying to develop a concept of uncutting or uncut as a positive statement rather than the negative statement that it used to be. So without further ado, let's turn it over. Her topic today is how language, mythology and popular culture upheld FGMC in Sudan. Samira, welcome. I can't hear Samira. I hope that um, I hope that you've turned the curls over to her. Nahla, have you got the uh, sound on? Yes, we can be able to can you hear me now. Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Ellen. And it, it's nice to be with uh, such a, a, a great group and uh, to, to just present a, a little bit of, uh, of what others may, may have more, more of uh, information, you know, like uh, discussing other issues uh, than the one I am doing now. 
uh, I think I, I, I have concentrated on, on an issue which, uh, which has not been very much open for discussion that the root causes, you know, of harmful practices and how people uphold, you know, some practices um, is we, we don't go deeply into the culture and see how the language and the, the stories told to children and to families and the way people communicate among themselves, how does it impact on upholding and upholding a, a tradition or upholding a practice or making it, you know, like takes longer than, than expected. And this is what actually I'm trying to do by, by inserting some of the information I collected from some surveys and researches we did in some parts of the country where we collected information about what do people say, what do, what do people um, discuss and communicate at the family level. And I think next, um, so, uh, so I actually I just gave like a, a theoretical framework at the beginning about why, why we consider this as social norms, because most of what people do on, on practices like FGM has to do with behavioral rules and uh, these behavioral rules are made and are constructed, social constructed, uh, depending on what people believe on, especially in groups or members of close communities. And at the same time, there are scripts that make them continue. So they are embedded into scripts and these scripts can come out in the form of uh, what people say or what people register or what people discuss among themselves. So. Um, they, they, that's why it, the norms themselves become part of a very thick network of beliefs and practices that people do. And these networks really support the norm itself, even if there are no sanctions. But actually in the, in the case of uh, uh, FGMC, we find that there are some social sanctions that are not spoken of, which we will we'll tackle uh, later next. Um, uh, next, somebody's uh, handling this or I should hand it. Okay, so to identify this is sometimes we say these harmful practices are often not norms, but actually they are held by very core social norms. And that's why we, we have issues of differential treatments, for instance, among boys and girls, among women and men, among children of different socioeconomic groups, etc. They identify and they become like core core um, uh, norms upon which some values are established and these values create the, the, create the space for identifying how a harmful practice can continue because of such co uh, core uh, norms. So if we look at a practice, we observe it, we define its nature and understand why, why it is done, what, what are the reasons, what are the driving forces behind it, what are the reasons for doing it. And that's how we identify what people are doing um, as harmful or not harmful. Um, next. So the, the process of identifying it will, will, will take us to the point of uh, expectations. Uh, and this is part of the theory of social norms and the theory of behavioral change that if there are expectations which, um, um, which are set up and people um, conform to those, this means that uh, a social norm that leads to a practice or a practice that is actually functioning because of there is a core norm holding it is because one believes that others are doing it or um, there are empirically expectations which we think are actually what we see or what we observe or what we, we think, we believe that a girl at the age of so-and-so should be prepared for cutting, for instance. Normative expectations are when you believe that others expect you to conform to do. So we ought to do because others are doing it. So it's typically uh, because there are also social sanctions behind it. So the normative expectations become very important actually because they are internalized in the way people believe about what others expect them to be or we expect others we ought to be doing that because we are part of a group and because we should be accepted in that group. So the belief that this norm is almost universally endorsed makes it very widely uh, conformed to. 
and it becomes a widespread conformity of that. Um, the result of that is following this norm by the majority. And so we have like a critical mass that according to which we can say that this is the preference of, of the majority. Next. So they expect the expectation that very essential to uphold or to look at or to dig on are the normative and uh, and uh, um, and uh, empirical expectations. So what what, the, what what do we mean by upholding or which normative expectations do really uh, make FGM continue for such a long time if we talk about 3000 years uh, as, as, as an origin or as a, a historically, um, you know, a specified time for how it was, it, it could be traced. So it, actually this, we look at the language of which, by which FGM is labeled. How do people label FGM? What do, how, what do they call it? What do they talk about it? How do they, what are the terminologies used for it? The other thing is what culture defines for females, because sometimes you find that the core values that relate to the status of females, um, you know, male-female relationships and the power relationships actually define how we put a, a female in a position where the culture can um, um, create a lot of um, stories, a lot of uh, uh, literature around how she should continue to be uh, labeled as a female. And the third one is the scripts that are communicated through generations. What do uh, older people say to the younger people? How does it go from family uh, generations through generations and how is that communication within the family and the community actually set up the scripts uh, according to which this is upheld. Uh, next, so, so these are the three like three um, upholding normative expectations affecting FGM. So if we look at the terminologies and you look at the language versus the expectations, you find that according to the terminologies and the language in Sudan, I'm talking specifically about Sudan, um, these have connotations of normative expectations. So we say tahur, tahur means purification. Matahara, this is like uh, um, uh, adverb, matahara means purify. Mahsuna, uh, because in different parts of the country you find some different labels for it, but they are all leading to one value or one um, um, image of how uh, a female should be when she is cut. So mahsuna means in a better situation. Masahama means identified or labeled. So she's, that's why. And th there is there are other terminologies related to we, we We were on the terminologies that are used and these are used in different parts of the country, not only in, in, in uh, urban areas. But basically the main, the main terminologies used in the language is tahur. Uh, all of this means purified, purification, etc. And then we have khitan and makhtuna, which means cutting or have been cut. So th these are like nouns and adverbs to describe the status and to, to show uh, what, what people use when they communicate. The normative expectations of all of this has already established a, a value system which is actually related to purity, cleanliness, hygiene, chastity, marriageability, preferred sexuality, acceptability, and religiously required. So basically, then the normative expectations of these have been very positive, which means that the value system that have been established for hundreds of years relates the terminology or the language to the value system and to the expectations of what it means when you are uh, are cut or when you are circumcised. Next. Next, when you go, um, yes, uh, you go be beyond that, there are terms and, and expectations after the first cut, which are usually for married women or women who have, or females who have passed through, through uh, delivery um, uh, cases or have, have experienced uh, one way or another a recircumcision. And this is called Adel. Adel means make it right or literally making it straight. So recircumcision or reinfibulation is, is actually in the language 
very positive. It says Adal. Uh, and Adal itself is a word which comes from the word, even if you look at um, Adl, Adl in, in Arabic means justice. <laughs> so it is, it is actually, you know, making it, renew it, making it straight or whatever. Ma'adula means this is the adverb of it, which means she has been re-circumcised and now she is an, in, in a better state. And the expectations of that, especially for women who have given birth, is that they, they become sexually appealing and resumes virginity status because a woman, when she is, is under adal, it means that she has been re-circumcised, she has been closed, she has been more tight, and it challenges the men's virility. So basically, the expectation is that this is a challenge to a man's virility because throughout the life of the female in, in Sudan, and this is very Sudan specific, uh, Adel is done even without reasoning. It could be for cosmetic surgery. But actually, as I think I have a paper with Ellen when we, we spoke about um, disempowering the already empowered, the men, which means you make it difficult for them. So it is a challenge to the virility and it goes throughout the life of the female until she is older. And by the time this challenge is, you know, a man get older, the challenge is even very, very, very difficult. And it is an, a cosmetic surgery after delivery. This is the expectation. So that's why sometimes it is done even in the public hospitals, in the government hospitals by the midwives. And um, so you find even the language itself reinforces or upheld a, a, a practice even after, after uh, women get uh, older. Next. Um, we have additional terminologies, of course, in the language, Ghalfa, which means uncut. And Ghalfa is a, is a very a word, very, um, it has a very um, negative meaning, uh, or Mama Tahara. So either you make uh, the cut or the Matahara or purified, you just add to it Ma, which means she's not purified, she's not circumcised. Uh, and both of them, Ghalfa or Mama Tahara, are used interchangeably. So when you when you speak about the status of being uncut, you use two adverse uh, uh, terminologies, and both of them have normative expectations, which have been set up in the system of communication to uh, include dirt, shame, ridicule, ostracism, uh, not trustworthy, promiscuous, and penis-like structure. Most of these are are, are also set up to upheld the situation that when she is not cut or when she is alpha, then this is very negative. And so the expectation, the normative expectation, which has made the norm uh, socially accepted, is that because of the negative, uh, negative uh, expectations or negative uh, description or labeling of of a state of being not cut. Next. And this picture is from a comic book that have been uh, the, uh, prepared or actually uh, when we were doing the Salima, it was the story of Amal and Salima and how the girls, even if she is not cut with Shalfa, they ridicule her or they actually, she gets a very bad, uh, you know, labeling from her peers. Um, so the, what happens with the social sanctions related to the uh, being uncut is exclusion and negative descriptions that are really related. I mean, earlier, they were very much um, um, related to the description of prostitution and slavery. And sometimes, um, you, you, not only that, you find that um, a lot of stories are, are put on that. Also, if you remember, Ellen, when we did the research in Kesala in Eastern Sudan, yes, and yes. we had the Adenda women talking about their experiences with, uh, with uncut uh, women. And uh, this was very unspoken of. And I mean, that was really a pioneer study when they started to speak about it and how it related very much to the 
to, to how we link it to ethnicity and what is the meaning of, of ethnicity versus, um, you know, uh, slavery or prostitution uh, related to cutting or uncutting. So I think the social sanctions uh, relate also to, to, to so many, uh, to a value system which actually gives a negative uh, connotation to, to being uncut. So the unfaithfulness trait, being a traitor, not sexually fulfilling, not conforming, etc. This may relate to, um, um, they may relate actually if you don't cut your daughter or if you don't, it, it relates to being accepted in the community, in the network or not. Not, not actually looking at um, internally on how uh, sexually she is behaving or not, but actually to be to be accepted in the social network in the community, and so uh, if they don't do it, it means they are not conforming, and sometimes um, they are labeled as being harmful to society be because they are deviant and they are diverging from the norm. So and sometimes it could be a rejection for money, and this is. I'm not talking about now, I'm talking about why it has been held for quite a long time. Because if you go deeply into the into analysis of how the communication about it was actually something not spoken of, it is not easy to see. Sometimes you just see the harms or you see the, the impact or you see the results of a practice. But you don't, if you don't go in deeply into analyzing why it has been set for quite a long time, uh, that will not help very much in the change people are looking for. So I think that's why um, this kind of um, research that we have started earlier is important to, to, to see when you start planning for change. So the social sanctions uh, make it like a norm that is being sanctioned and sometimes not only exclusion, sometimes uh, when, uh, uh, I mean, some of the sanctions or the, the rewards for it um, are very dynamic. I mean, if you find that earlier there were rewards for cutting and you find that even the public uh, festivity and the celebrations, etc., were very open, very, um, you know, participatory and everybody knows about them and very vocal. This is changing, but it doesn't mean that it is a sanction. It means that there are changes in the way rewards are changing. So I think that's why I'm, I'm looking at the, the, the social norm and how it is, it is, it relates actually sometimes to how sanctions are created or set up by the community itself. That's why we say it's constructs. These are constructs by the communities. Next. Yes, let's keep moving since we have uh, yes. much to The come. result is that, of course, we are appalled that what happens is you uphold a negative practice, a harmful practice of cutting and violence with positive values. And this critical uh, gap in the language has made the words that used to describe the uncircumcised or the circumcised, you know, the circumcised to be wholly positive. And the focus on the language holding the practice was identified as a very critical task. Mm -hmm. So the communication that of the families was limited by transmitting the mythology and stories without any scientific evidence. Next. So if we look at the mythologies, you find that there are many stories that have been set up uh, in, the, in, the, in the culture and have been taken forward as up, upholding the practice. So the story of the Pharaoh of Moses is one of the famous stories that you hear in every part of the country. If you go east, north, west, south, everywhere, everybody will say that the Pharaoh, this is pharaonic. So they, they take, when people talk about the origin of it, they say Pharaohs just because there was a mythology. This mythology took part of, part of the Quran, part of um, a myth, and part of a story of Moses and um, that the, one of the pharaohs has dreamed that his reign, he will be taken over or overthrown by somebody. Uh, and this boy will be from a specific ethnic group. So what they did was to cut women, stitch them, and the midwife will see if it is a man, if it's a boy, then it will be killed. If it's a female or a girl, then she will be left uh, alive. And that's why 
this kind of uh, infibulation came into being. That, that's when people were looking at the origin of, of FGM. And actually, because some of the, of the <clears throat> remnants of farms were found, you know, the, in the... Anyhow, that's how... This is one of the stories that everybody speaks. And actually, it was... Um, it really did um, an impact on how people um, uh, fought FGM because they were fighting one type for a long time and everybody was saying the pharaonic is not the type that we need. We have to stop the pharaonic and it took longer time to be upheld. The other story is the story of the white worm causing itching, which is a story that every village in the country would say that when a girl is growing up, she's in the adolescent um, stage and of course there are hormonal changes, then they start to, to to say that there's some secretions come coming out of the vagina, and that's they think that these white are worms. They and they call them worms, and they have to be cut. So they go for cutting because they think this is more healthy for a female to grow, for a female to grow. And sometimes when they are very skinny and whatever, they would say because they have not been cut. So the mythology of a white worm is not only in Sudan. I have seen it among the Kenyan Somalis. And, and they use the burning of the vagina to, 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 to cure of so many illnesses and diseases. The preference of dry sex is, a, again, as an, another mythology. Every girl in the family is, is taught that when she goes for, for marriage, she has to have dry sex. She has to dry herself. No secretions and whatever. And the, this preference makes it tougher, harder, and painful. And so the issue of having dry sex has always been a mythology because of the understanding that the secretions are not, are not um, good for sex, which is the, the opposite of whatever ev sex uh, evidence is by, by science. Then the story of that, if you leave the girl without cutting, then her um, clitoris would become uh, grow like penis. And that uh, if you leave her also, the entire will look like an ugly frog. So these are stories that usually the grandmothers would keep telling or telling about, you know, talking about and taking it on board as part of the. So a man or a, a female or a male from the same house will come with the same uh, social cultural context through these mythologies. Another mythology is that if you touch, these touches of clothes will increase the sex desire. And that the cutting and stitching are actually sutra. Sutra means protection or uh, 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 it's, it's part of you, you keep a girl protected from birth to death. That's why even older women would go for cutting because they think that will make them, uh, you know, sutra, which will hide or it's not shameful for them to, to show their genitalia. And it is also shameful because it is believed that if you don't cut, if you if you leave her uncut, then this means increasing her sex desire. All these stories added to them are stories even in the you know in the with modernization and girls going into honeymoons and whatever they would say they have been sent back because they have been found uncut. Uh, so and lately reinforcing FGMC by linking it to religion, this is very late because most of the researches that have been going on throughout the years have not shown that link in the minds of the people. It's just during the 70s, 80s that this is increasing. And then the use of uh, bahur, bahur means incense. Dukhan also is a, part, a, a kind of incense in Sudan and perfumery. Most of these, garad and shab, most of these are herbal uh, cures for to make vagina naru. So they think that this is next. These are all like stories that are told. So what happens, why the normative expectations are held by myth is the unequal sexual rights by gender, the shame created by full genitalia, sutra to be uh, gender specific, and mixing religious justifications with non-religious context, the fear of gossip and exclusion and enforcing non-scientific knowledge 
and respect to the culture of silence for females and that sexuality becomes an unspoken of factor or as the root cause which is not spoken of. Next. Next. So what is culturally transmitted comes out in the form of proverbs. These proverbs, I'm not going to go through them because the time is not very much. Uh, we don't have much time, but what I am saying, these proverbs have been collected from different parts of the country. Most of the connotations of these proverbs, which I have written in Arabic English, with the meaning of them, uh, they, they show the connotations, the preference of males to females, the stereotype gender roles, and the um, sutra, meaning females are symbols of honor, and uh, education as a priority for males, and this functioning of females, even if they are strong, like one of them, which I can say here, even if, if she goes, if she learns law, she has to come back to the kitchen. Can get al-ghanun, akhira lil kanun. This is one of the very famous three verbs that I collected from uh, some communities in the, in the East, in the West. And the normative expectations is that there, are, there is reference to um, preferred marriage of, uh, of preferring marriage to, uh, to education, cutting and kitchen for females. Uh, so this is like the, this is like the sociocultural context upon which the proverbs, the stories are culturally transmitted to keep in mind that you have to keep the core norms and to make the cutting next, continue. Next. So how did the communication work? Earlier, all the communication work was upstream. So we are looking for a law, we are looking for whatever, but the, actually the problem was the lack of engaging between public and between the family level communication, which Mama Iqbal is now doing. That is the family's talk everybody in the community are part of it. So the focus earlier was only on the problem. And this focus have come out into posters that were very negative, only talking about violence, death, the act of cutting itself, the blood, the, you know, all of these issues came into the posters, into whatever appeared, because communities were not engaged in doing them. They are prepared, prepared and then sent out as problems. Next. So this is how the communication worked. Next. So what happened was that the latest facts was almost with all the communication that has been going on up to the 80s, for instance, the, the prevalence continued to be very high for the age group that is continuing to be cutting 15 to 49, but there is a reduction in the age group zero to 14, which shows that there will be some changes because of the changes in the communication modalities. There are changes in the age group which is at high risk of cutting the fairest cut. But the other age group, which is 15 to 49, this is repeatedly calculated in all the uh, national statistics and show a very high, uh, high, high prevalence. Um, in, in the in-depth analysis that was done in 2016, it has shown that the intention to abandon FGM is six more times among women who use Salima for Ghalfa instead of saying alpha and alpha because it's a very nasty word it's not easy to say you know so salima took over and actually this has proven by evidence of evaluation next so how a social norm is abandoned is there is a core group it's important for the fusion and i think uh Tuti could be one of those examples there is an alternative positive messaging approach with going on uh, especially with the Salima uh, approach. Uh, and then it says the steps of course that the community discussions and decisions and commitments come from the community dialogue. And that new value, not the, the same values will continue, but the practice will change, but without changing the values, which means that lengthy and effortful deliberations in the community required that people should think of an alternative instead of talking about the hazards of FGM to talk about the goodness of being Salima. Next. And that's why when, when, when Salima came on, on board as a, 
as a changing norm, not only as a terminology, not it's a changing norm, and so it is a movement. It became inclusive, multi-generational, non-adverse, adverse, there is no adver, adverse, or I mean, people are confident about what they are saying, caring, and most of the branding of Salima shows social harmony and community cohesion, progress towards, um, you know, towards a movement, beautiful, and the girls and women at all ages are included, even if they are cut or not cut. And it is a reflection, a positive reflection of the self or of the society. Next. These are the new scripts, which we think should be working during the coming time. That new scripts for the new uh, norm, which is Salima, is we need more research on the health perspective to show that born and kept Salima as the best physiological scenario for females, reproductive, sexual, and health rights. This is one, one part of the scripts. So it needs more research, more evidence, and more inclusion of medical and health uh, professionals and uh, health, pro health service providers to give us new information. This information should be the new script to be taken on board, not to go back only to the others, but to go to new health uh, information. Next, the religious uh, perspective. We have three uh, scripts. The religious perspective is that leaving the girl Salima enforces the core religious value of no harm or injury. La darara wa la dirar. This is very important. And Salima is accepted by religion and there is no punishable. It's not punishable by religion. This is a script. And if this script is also dicked upon and uh, became a, a, the advocacy um, uh, perspective of the religious, uh, the religious perspective and the advocacy for change, I think it will reduce the conflict that has taken quite a long time between religious leaders, whether we are sticking to one type or not. The, the third uh, script, three, next, is the, the legal perspective which means laws banning FGM could be advocated for as protective girls from harm and to practitioners from being punished. So what we think law can do is to complement what the social, um, the social movements are doing. Next. I think this is the next. A special note here, no, sorry. Very important, the one before this one. When these normative expectations are inconsistent with empirical expectations, we don't expect to be punished when we violate the normative expectations. That's why if we, even if we have laws, we think laws are not laid down to punish the majority as Christina Bisheri has said, because the majority will be the parents, the neighbors, the family members, everybody. Laws are not laid to punish the majority. They are to punish the practitioners those who are doing the cutting. Otherwise, it may fire back if we do a law without reaching the, um, the, the social change that we, are, we have been driving for and that communities look for laws as protective rather than punitive only, not at that level. So that's why I think it's very important to take this special note. And finally, Thank you very much. And I'm very sorry for the inconvenience that has taken place. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Samira. That is wonderful talk. I wish we had more time for questions, but in the view of the, how far behind we are, um, I, I want to move on to Krista. But I, I understand that first, we're going to have a very quick greeting by Dr. Yusra Abdelmajoub from the Sudanese American Women Doctors. And then we, so the next part will be about the uh, in in America, what's happening, and Krista will get us into that as soon as Yusra has finished her brief remarks, and then at the end, I hope we'll have time for discussion of everything. Shall we move along? Then Yusra, are you there? Yes. Dr. Hello, everyone. Thank yeah. you for the opportunity. This is Yusra Adin Mahgoub from Sauda. Uh, Sauda is a Sudanese American Woman Doctors Association. It is a nonprofit organization registered in the state of Michigan since 2014. 
SAMA was created by an enthusiastic group of women physicians in the city of Grand Plank, Michigan. And in Saudi, we believe that women doctors are faced by unique challenges while in their way to practice or pursuing a career in medicine, as well as other general obstacles. And in Sauda, we support women academically, psychologically, as they proceed forward in their careers. So Sauda also involved in community health education, free health clinic and services inside and outside US. And FGM, women health, is one of our main area of interest. Uh, FGM affects women and girls and shape their lives in a very negative way at an early age. And it's mostly carried out on young girls between infancy and age 15. As we all know, each year, around 4 million girls are worldwide at risk of undergoing FGM. So our all efforts to eliminate this harmful practice and we need to end it as soon as possible as we can. Uh, one more time, thank you, Sama, for the opportunity. And uh, I would like to introduce Sauda. Uh, Sauda is a relatively a new organization. We are looking for donation, help, and collaboration with other more stabilized organizations like Sama, specifically in the area of women health and to address violence against women at all ages. We are also in collaboration and starting to work with organi organizations interested in women rights and specifically women rights to vote and to be represented and to be heard. Uh, finally, I would like to invite everyone who watching us uh, to join Sauda. Membership is free and all always. Uh, you can also learn more about Sauda at our main website, our Facebook page, and all our social accounts. Uh, one more time, thank you everyone. Thank you for all your efforts. Uh, I'm so glad to be here, to be part of this great. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yusra. It is very good to hear from uh, what's going on in other parts of, of the United States. And um, I think our speakers today have really been giving us so much to talk about. So um, let's make sure we have some time for them by moving along now to hear Krista Johnson Agbaku. I'd like to tell you, she is someone that I've met um, and, uh, I've met in the it, 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 over the years at conferences. She's an obstetrician and gynecologist at Valley Wise Health and is the founding director of Refugee Women's Health Clinic and the director of the Office of Refugee Health in the Southwestern Interdisciplinary Center at Arizona State University, uh, which is in the American Southwest, located in the city of Phoenix, I think, for the most part. Her research investigates strategies that improve the sexual and reproductive health outcomes for refugee women newly arrived from many different countries. She'll tell us about that. But she's particularly knowledgeable about the women who have undergone um, female genital mutilation or cutting and um, other forms of uh, gender-based violence that they work with in their clientele. So she has a federally funded grant by the United States government and, and she's been working to improve healthcare, community engagement and provider cultural competency um, on FGMC. So she, her uh, work with CDC and with the World Health Organization is well known. And she's speaking today on the topic of best practices in the care of women in the female genital mutilation cutting uh, community in Arizona. So welcome, uh, welcome to Dr. Krista. And uh, without further ado, let's hear what you can tell us about your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's truly a pleasure to be with you all today and to learn so much about what's happening in Sudan and to really be among such uh, amazing champions um, and advocates for um, women's and gender health and equity. Can you hear me well? Yes, can I, can. Me? I can, but yes. I just wanted to suggest to everyone that if they want to use the chat, they can post questions for anyone as we go along and that will help us for the discussion at the end. So go ahead, Krista. 
Great. So just in the interest of time, I'm going to um, move along over the, just the next 15, 20 minutes or so. I'm going to just provide an overview of some of the clinical care aspects of caring for women affected by female genital cutting, and then describe some of the emerging evidence that we have um, uh, uncovered with my work, my federal grant uh, addressing FGC across the state of Arizona. And then I'll provide some pearls on how we can enhance culturally sensitive care and then conclude with some health policy and research directives. So first of all, I wanted to talk about the major challenge that we face given this uh, COVID pandemic. Let me see if I can go back to the previous slide. Okay, so with this, well, I think I have a little bit of a lag with a uh, slight advancement. So we're in the immersed in this global COVID-19 pandemic crisis and the United Nations Population Fund put out a report last spring that really looked at the consequences to the health and human rights of women and girls as a result of this pandemic. And it was projected that there are far reaching consequences to women's health uh, that can, would be for the next decade. And you can see the various uh, issues of which FGMC, female genital mutilation and cutting is one of them. So clearly uh, we have heard reports, uh, more of the reports I heard were coming out of Somalia, for instance, of just a rise in young girls who have been um, subjected to FGC because of the pandemic with schools being closed, girls being home, the economic disruption with uh, loss of jobs and women who were traditional circumcisers taking that back up again just because of the economic constraints and that this is a serious threat to women and girls' health. And it's not just FGC, you can see uh, the risk for the next 10 years of child marriage, gender-based violence, unintended pregnancy. And we also see that there's been a clear disruption in programs and services and safe spaces, uh, programmatic care and support, um, and underutilization of health services. And so I'm going to just spend a few minutes talking about ways that we have been able to optimize clinical care here in Arizona. So for the past 13 years, uh, we have had the Refugee Women's Health Clinic that I founded in 2008, and we are really grounded in uh, investing in our community. As you can see this displayed, we are a team that comprises cultural health navigators. These are women and men who are leaders within their communities. They are trained medical interpreters. They speak upwards of 18 languages, and they represent the various uh, communities and cultures that we see and provide care for here in the state of Arizona. Um, over the past 13 years, we have grown to serve women from across uh, 60, close to 60 countries and uh, speaking close to 17 languages, but we are really embedded in um, providing a patient-centered medical home for newly arrived refugee and immigrant families. And that is part of our mission to provide culturally and linguistically appropriate services, as well as reduce and eliminate health disparities and barriers to care. And so we are grounded in uh, four key, or three key, key principles and that we were locally accessible and globally minded, helping refugee women navigate the healthcare system and increase their health seeking behavior. We seek to overcome barriers to care, providing culturally sensitive care and we seek to empower women in helping to eliminate some of the myths surrounding labor delivery um, and um, improving their access to care and experiences with care. So as you said, we serve women from across um, close to 60 countries encompassing Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. Relating to FGC, we here in Arizona, we have a largely East African patient population, predominantly Somali, but we do see quite a number of Sudanese women, as well as women from Djibouti and Eritrea, um, who've been affected by this practice. 
And these are just some of the languages that are spoken by our team of cultural health navigators who are really the bedrock of all of our care and services in terms of building trust, helping women navigate the healthcare system, addressing health literacy challenges, given that many of our women have never had formal education and may not necessarily even read or write in their native language, much, much less English. And so we do a lot of work using audiovisual modalities and direct face-to-face -face, um, discussion. And obviously that's been challenged due to uh, COVID and that we've not been able to engage in a lot of the community outreach and engagement in the apartment complexes and communities where our communities um, and our women live. Uh, but we are using more social media and telephonic and video um, telehealth visits to, to reach our community. Krista, and so our I can yes? for just a second. Your sound is breaking up a bit. Sure. Is there anything you can do with your microphone to make it clearer, perhaps uh, replug it or I don't know, just um, I, it was brought to my attention sure. that people are having trouble hearing you. Okay, let me see if I could um, let me see if I can um, change my settings to use um, a headset. This might make a difference. One second. Yeah, I'm, I'm, sorry, in, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt the flow of your thinking. Oh, no, it's okay. it might improve. Yeah, but you're right. right. <laughs> These photographs, these photographs are amazing. Amazing. Yes. Yes. Um, not, let me see if I can. Um, that sounds better. Already. Have, hmm. Maybe you've done I'm something. Not sure. Hmm. Now it's really good. Yeah, it's much better, Krista. Thank huh. you. Whatever you did seems to have worked. Let me go ahead and continue and let me know if this happens again. Okay. Um, yeah, please interrupt me if I'm breaking up again, but um, I'll go and resume and we get back to the okay. Thank you. presentation. Yeah. So in terms of our integrated care model, we are anchored around uh, providing, as I've described as well, um, communication to promote health literacy, intensive care coordination to minimize gaps in care, and then deep embeddedness within the community as well as capacity building to, to elevate the capacity for us to really reach members within the communities and nurture and sustain trust. And so we formed a Refugee Women's Health Community Advisory Coalition very early on from the very inception of our clinic 13 years. See, it's comprised of stakeholders from across our community who are engaged in working with newly arrived refugee families. So this encompasses grassroots ethnic community-based organizations, academic institutions, our state refugee resettlement program, our public health department, faith-based community organizations and other community and social services working in partnership with our healthcare providers and our team. And they really inform what we do to um, help shape our programmatic and research um, initiatives. And so when we talk about FGMC or you know, general cutting and clinical services, you know, since we serve a largely East African patient population, uh, we see type three as the predominant form of cutting. And with that, there are um, significant consequences to the health and well being of women affected with type 3 in terms of obstetrical concerns, gynecological concerns. And often with type 3, um, women need defibrillation, which is a surgical release of that vulvar covering um, over the vaginal opening to be able to facilitate childbirth. And so, with that, we provide significant counseling and education of our patients, as well as our provider teams and our trainees. We train um, residents, OBGYN, um, as well as um, medical students who are rotating through our department. And really just enhancing the capacity 
of our hospital to be able to meet these very specialized and unique needs for this community. And we provide a lot of anticipatory guidance to our women in terms of what to expect uh, with uh, labor as well as what to expect after release of that scar, the, 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 the circumcision of scar in terms of your urinary flow may change. What are the changes to her body image, her genital self-image, um, and 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 how does this um, now relate to her engagement with her partner, and how um, does she feel in terms of um, having undergone the surgery? That's something that very little research has been focused on. The other thing we want to ensure is that patients really are informed and autonomous in their decision making. We find that they're your sound is oh, awkward wow. again. Your sound is a very strong matriarchal forces. Um, that Chris, okay. your sound is very strange again. Could you very strange again? Okay. okay. Let me turn off my video. I'm gonna stop the video. Um, so okay, that might help. That might help. As long as you're, as long as you're yeah, there. As long as you're, um, you can still control your your. Um, your, your okay. slideshow. Can we, still, can we still hear you? Krista? Yes, we, can you hear me? Oh, beautiful. That's very clear. Yeah. Oh, you, Perfect. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, let me continue and hopefully um, this may help with me being off video. Yes, it sounds perfect now. It's very good. Okay. So as I was saying, um, we really want to make sure that patients are autonomous in their decision making uh, relating to um, choices they may make about um, pursuing defibrillation um, because they are often um, strong matriarchal influences because women will be going home to the social support of their family and extended relatives and community who may um, interject their views in terms of what she should do relating to management of her scar after delivery. So it's very important that patients are autonomous um, and, and empowered to stand up for what they would want for their bodies. And it's something we could talk more about during the discussion. The other thing I want to say is that it's important to have a um, holistic lens, bringing in specialists when needed in terms of providing pelvic floor physical therapy, sexual health counseling, emotional counseling, psychological counseling for women who have experienced anxiety and depression that may, or other emotional distress relating to having undergone genital cutting. And so that's really important to be mindful of how we can work across the aisle with our colleagues and other specialties in enhancing the holistic approach to care for, for women. And so when you think about care, there's also social determinants of health, which is thinking about health literacy, distrust of the healthcare system, the, the confluence of challenges between traditional health beliefs and Western values and how that might influence women's decision-making about their bodies. And I talked about patient autonomy already, um, as well as what can we do to help reduce stigma? Because there's significant stigma um, in the community, uh, as well as among providers in that may um, interfere and be a barrier to health seeking for women. And then there are also structural barriers to care relating to um, adequate health insurance coverage, um, legal issues, um, and challenges, language barriers, adequacy of available interpretation services, being able to have transportation to clinical visits, and also gender concordance of the staff. That's absolutely important um, because of um, norms around openly discussing and talking about she sees with a male provider or with um, even with it's a male. Uh, interpreter over the phone can al al often be very uncomfortable. So you really want to pay attention to gender concordance with the healthcare team and the patient. And then often I find is that men tend to be villainized in the past just because of, uh, I guess, the, the pa patriarchal, um, patrilineal, um, historical origins um, and 
um, perspectives around the um, endurance of this practice. But I find is that engaging the male partner, the husband, the spouse, um, the father is so critical because they are the strongest supporters of their wives and, and their partners and can really be a huge ally in helping to support women in their decisions to consider surgical interventions, for instance, in managing her and any complications she may have experienced, especially sexual health concerns relating to FGC. And then providers in the United States, we've done uh, quite a bit of research that really unpacks that providers are not adequately trained. Uh, they are woefully unskilled and not um, the sensitivity needed um, in being able to provide uh, culturally sensitive care, as well as competency in the surgical skills of um, performing defibrillation procedures. And so there must be an effort to sustain provider education. And really, as I mentioned before, engage a multidisciplinary team in the care of the patients. And so this is something that I am really so proud um, and I'd love to see that uh, Dr. Lucrezia Catania is on this call, but my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Jasmine Abdul Kadir, has really led a lot of the global efforts to really enhance the capacity of healthcare providers in um, understanding how to care for women and perform surgical techniques of defibrillation. And so this is some of the uh, videos that Dr. Abdul Kader has developed, um, providing a clear overview about the practice as well as the actual surgical technique of defibrillation. And um, we've worked together for many years and uh, we've, she also was instrumental in helping to develop a toolkit that you can see here. Uh, she spent a sabbatical with me um, a, a few years ago. And as part of her time with our center and on our clinic, she was help, help, very instrumental in putting together this resource guide for healthcare providers that we have disseminated um, across the United States internationally, and she was very instrumental in getting this, uh, this guide translated in multiple languages, including German, French, and Italian. And uh, this is something that is freely downloadable from the website link and can be used to help in the training of students and residents and other practitioners. Um, it's focused on um, approaches to care and counseling, documentation in the medical records, and uh, provides additional information around uh, US laws, um, but it can be used internationally um, as well. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So let me now just provide just a brief overview of some of the evidence. So as Dr. Grunbaum had said in her introduction, I have had a federal grant to really examine the way we are enhancing care and, um, and evaluating the engagement with communities. Um, I was one of eight sites that were funded across the United States um, over a three year period. And here in Arizona, we conducted a very large survey primarily of Somali women, nearly 900 Somali women in the state of Arizona, identifying gaps and barriers to care experiences of cutting perceptions and attitudes about the practice. We trained um, nearly 700 healthcare providers across multiple fields, pediatrics, family medicine, OBGYN, emergency medicine, behavioral health, on caring for women affected by this practice. And we engaged in um, significant outreach and community forums with the community, engaging religious leaders, men, youth, elders, um, as well as women. And so one of the initial data that we, what we see that's emerging from our analysis is that there are concerns regarding psychological distress. We administered an emotional distress tool to examine feelings of depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress. And we found that there were 15% positive screens among the women in our survey who completed our survey. And 25% of our sample experienced regret for having undergone female genital cutting. Largely women did not have a choice in undergoing this practice. And when we looked at predictors of psychological distress, we found that significant factors that stood out was having a history of trauma, um, experiencing immediate complications of female genital cutting, 
as well as perceived discrimination and being um, of Somali Bantu ethnicity which is an ethnic minority group um, um, within Somalia who ha have a history of discrimination and human rights um, abuses. And even here in the US context, uh, continue to experience um, um, of significant disparities in health and um, uh, um, have from profound health and social service needs. And this was clearly reflected in our data as well. Some saw where there are often, uh, for women that are associated with psychological distress, including difficulty with first intercourse, lack of pleasure during sexual intercourse, possessing poor genital self-image. Um, there was increased odds of infertility, as well as extensive um, complications relating to childbirth, such as tearing or and blood loss during childbirth, as well as recurrent urinary tract infection. And then we also, in a separate study um, um, analysis, excuse me, we looked at the impact of victimization. And when we talk about victimization, it's not just exclusive just to genital cutting. Uh, we looked at all forms of violence against women in terms of women, especially in the U.S. context. Refugees have been ex uh, are uh, have experienced forced displacement due to war um, and. Uh, and, and violence and human rights atrocities and, and abuses. And so we were able to capture that women in our sample had experienced torture, gender-based violence, such as rape as a weapon of war, domestic violence, intimate, intimate partner violence, child abuse, abduction, and tra trafficking, forced and early child marriage, and involuntary family separation. These are all um, forms of violence that have an impact on victim and so we looked at the connection between victims and people who had been exposed to a form of violence had more health problems, namely sexual intercourse difficulty, um, pregnancy concerns, depression and trauma, as well as problems with their gynecologic health, genital health. We also saw that exposure to violence means that there are more healthcare needs for women and girls in Arizona. And you can see those who had experienced a form of violence had greater healthcare needs, namely um, general healthcare, concerns for women's health, dental care, eye care. The, the, they expressed a need for further education on genital cutting as well as mental health care. So you can clearly see that a clear alignment for those who have, have experienced um, some form of victimization clearly having greater health care needs. So how do we enhance culturally sensitive care? Well, one of the first things I want to really highlight is that here in the United States, we have a history of racism and discrimination that we clearly have seen risen its head in the last year with the police brutality and greater attention to racial and social justice issues and concerns. And this definitely impacts in the healthcare space, where we know that women of color, especially uh, women of African descent, have been shown to have adverse outcomes relating to healthcare. Increased maternal morbidity and mortality are profound among the Black community. And when you look at the intersection of immigrants and migrant communities, especially migrant women of color, and African migrants, this collides with the historical history of racism and discrimination in the United States and really further um, magnifies the, the major gaps in respectful care due to the othering of black women's bodies that I've written about. And in terms of the profound uh, distrust and fear, stigmatization, particularly around cultural practices such as genital cutting can, can influence women's care experiences and result in refusal of care, delay in necessary care, and ultimately adverse outcomes, especially adverse pregnancy outcomes. We know and we're grappling with the high C-section rate, the high rate of emergency cesarean deliveries. Um, part of it, a lot of times, is very easy to focus on genital cutting itself as the cause of all of this, but I want to lift this up a bit and elevate the dialogue to think about what are the other experiences and adverse experiences with care that are grounded in implicit bias and discrimination and racism and the othering of Black women's bodies that are potentially playing a, a, a critical role in some of these adverse outcomes that we are seeing. 
And also one thing I want to emphasize is that, as I've said before, providers are not adequately trained. They have poor clinical skills, limited cultural competency, and really are unable to recognize the unique healthcare needs of women affected by FGC. And so we really need to move towards enhancing cultural humility in terms of how we provide patient-centered, respectful care where women are valued, where they are respected, that there is appropriate medical interpreters available during the care encounter, that we consider gender concordance and patient autonomy and ensure that we are building trust, empowering women and really engaging in, in the community to support this effort. And it really is a multi-pronged effort necessitating investment and embeddedness within the community to nurture and sustain trust, along with providing quality clinical care and advancing best practices in research and emerging evidence. And so we have remained engaged within the community and it really is a multi-pronged effort necessitating multiple stakeholders, men, women, youth, elders, faith-based leaders, ethnic community organizations and social service agencies, schools, law enforcement and social work. And I'm currently working with the Department of Justice on a national effort to really advance some of these directives uh, with the new funding that I've become involved in that, that is just getting underway. And while we're focused on FGC specifically, we also need to make sure we're not um, forgetting the larger umbrella of economic empowerment of women and, and moving towards advocacy to advance gender equity for women and address stigma reduction and intimate partner violence as well. There also remain um, important issues within these communities. And finally, I'm going to close with some health policy and research directives. In 2016, the United States launched its first ever summit to end violence against girls. It was a summit on FGC, bringing together stakeholders from across governmental agencies, nonprofit and civic, uh, civil society, uh, faith-based communities and community AC. I was part of the healthcare sector working group and we proposed recommendations for strategies to respond to general cutting in the United States, uh, aimed towards providing high quality care um, for women affected and those at risk, working across the aisle with collaborators to prevent cutting in the US and elsewhere. And then of course, to expand research on the prevalence of cutting in the United States, the medical and psycho psychological sequelae and what are the best evidence-based interventions to advance health equity. And so the end FGMC network now uh, exists within the US and we are coalescing uh, through this entity to bring all of our stakeholders together from across these various entities, the health sector, the policy, uh, governmental agencies, nonprofits and community agencies really working together to provide a repository for resources and um, a repository to connect clinicians across the country to, to announce events and really support uh, survivors and, and really work towards uh, really advancing a greater uh, work to uh, both prevent cutting as well as address the needs of women and girls who've been affected and enhancing the quality of care and social services for these communities across the US. And so, and finally, I want to say that there's so much more work to be done to really make sure that we are uh, developing clinical practice guidelines. Last summer, the American Academy of Pediatrics was able to publish the first ever comprehensive guidelines bringing together Dr. Nawal Noor, myself, Dr. Janine Young, and other um, clinicians and ethical experts and legal experts to really compile the first ever pediatric guidelines um, to enhance capacity among pediatricians across the United States to care for girls and adolescents. We do need to engage in more work with our behavioral health specialists, nurses and social workers, law enforcement especially, and child protective services in the US. To, we need to enhance guidelines for mandatory reporting. Um, I'm working with Dr. Jasmine abdul Kader um, regarding uh, creating a, a library of uh, educational photos and videos, especially of prepubertal girls and women. 
And uh, we need to update the diagnosis codes to be more reflective of the WHO typology because right now the diagnosis codes does not reflect the subtypes within the different classification schemes of FGC. And then of course we need to enhance funding, funding to support greater community engagement and research um, to advance equity um, across the US for affected populations. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much for, the for your time. And I hope we'll be able to engage in some discussion um, in this remaining time that we have. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Krista. It's wonderful to hear about your work. I remember when you first told me that you had become involved in this work, part of it was because you, as an African-American, as a woman of color, were looked to by other people to try to do something about a situation like this. And so the, the issue of unprepared clinicians and looking to people who might offer guidance has a, is a lot has a long history and i'm so delighted to hear how your work uh, collaborating with lucrezia catania jasmine abdelkader and abdelkader omar and uh, the and the others is so good and i'm so delighted to be able to bring you before the sudanese audience today because i think there's so much that we all have in common in our interest in trying to make improvements to stop the tendency to um, promote myths that or or negative comments that help people not be cared for well mm -hmm. and i think that the international groups that i've been in discussion with in sweden and italy and so on many people are interested in the work that that you're doing and and this guidance if i might just start off the questions um if, if anybody wants to post more in the chat please do but th there have been a couple already one of them and and i think it, it addresses both to samira's and krista's work um is first of all how have um have families been responding who are perhaps still interested in doing FGM in the United States or in other countries? You know, one of the uh, uh, one of the participants wrote in to say that she has experienced uh, people in other states asking um, women of color and, and Sudanese doctors and so on to be able to help them with this, or they talk about traveling home to their home country, the so-called vacation cutting, which, uh, and so maybe that would be something you could address. And it relates to the question that was brought up for Samira's work also about how have politics really impacted this? Have the political struggles in Sudan impacted how um, how the work can take place and how has COVID-19 impacted how the work can take, take place? So with those two questions on the table, could I ask you, Krista, to, to, for your comments? Sure. And then Samira, first Krista. Sure, can you hear me? Can you hear me well? Pretty well, yeah, I think. Okay, great, great. Well, um, few things really quick regarding politics i must also add in here in the united states this the last four years have had a tremendous impact on uh our engagement with the community here in arizona we are a border state and we've been ground zero for a lot of the immigration tensions and rhetoric and animus that have really um you know show showcased itself in terms of um working in our community uh, right after the prior Trump administration um, came into office, the first ever plane of um, Somalis were deported to Mogadishu, involving many from our community. And when I was just getting out my data collection in the community, no one wanted to participate because they felt that um, women would be separated from their children if um, there was word that their child may have undergone cutting and there was a lot of fear. Um, and this really was a major issue within the community because of just the political animus and targeting of minority groups, religious minorities, um, of which our community was uh, checked all of the boxes. And so there was significant tensions um, due to the rhetoric that has been profound over the last you know, several years here in the United States, which targeted communities of color, migrant communities, um, and it was a cause of great consternation, especially because of the lack of clarity in terms of 
um, uh, the U.S. laws and cutting and separation of families and children. So, so it, it's been really profound in that regard. But relating to um, concern for cutting being done in the U.S., that's something that we really need better data. Um, we have some anecdotal evidence, but from my clinical experience over 20 plus years, I've found that um, views and attitudes change and evolve. And that's something that we really need to look and pay close attention to in terms of, granted, we clearly, as, as has been articulated here, know that there are clear and strong social and cultural norms that remain quite embedded within the cultures where um, in, in Sudan and other regions where this is um, remains a, a highly prevalent practice. However, once communities, migrant communities now live in the West, um, attitudes shift over time. And we're seeing that emerging where it's not static. It's not um, what you uh, believed never evolves over time. And that's something we need to pay attention to in terms of how do perspectives and attitudes, what is that dynamic of change? How does that um, take place over time based on length of time that uh, families and communities now reside in the West? And how does that affect generationally as you are raising young children and young girls and adolescents and young men in the United States? And they then, um, you know, and how does that context evolve in terms of um, adherence to views and practices that were once normative but now are evolving with time? So I have not even taking off my white coat and being embedded in the communities, I have not sensed a groundswell, at least in the East African communities that I work with, that they're trying to still say, hurry up and circumcise their girls. I find that that um, definitely has not been my experience and of, of something that is heavily pervasive. Um, however, I do know that uh, questions regarding reinfibulation does persist and is very um, acute, especially in the Sudanese community that I and my patients that I serve, I know that there's still strong support for reinfibulation, which is separate, um, where uh, we find that there are more so in the, my Sudanese patient population than any of the other populations I work with, strong support for reinfibulation after delivery. So that's something that we grapple with. And then the discussion is well, um, clearly, the WHO comes down very strongly against reinfibulation of any kind, but I find that we need to consider women's genital self-image and that, and this is part of Dr. Abdul Qadir's work. In the oh, your image has- The clitoris remains very much- uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's really an important an important question. And um, you know, when you think of all the genital cosmetic surgeries that are going on today too, and you think this is something that an adult woman wants to preserve about her self image and her genital integrity, it definitely needs to be looked at in a different way than it has been till now. I think so. That raises an important issue. Um, but um, it was also raised that one of the uh, issues, if anybody would like to see more really interesting work related to what Krista and Jasmine Abdul Qadir were doing, I think the, the, the references on your slide were very good. But also Lucrezia uh, mentioned that there is an excellent TED Talk that Jasmine Abdul Qadir has done on YouTube, which is easily available. I've used it to try to educate journalists and um, students. And it's a wonderful, I don't have the link handy to post on, on here, but if you go to YouTube and do a search for the name Jasmine Abdul Qadir, you will find it. And um, it's a, a TED Talk that's well worth hearing. And if we might just, the did okay. you? Did you mention vacation cutting? Did are people sending their children home? Because uh, I think what you said about there is an adaptation among um, people from Africa in the United States to really not do it anymore. They they research in Sweden and in other countries has shown that. And I know Lucrezia told me in all her years in Italy, uh, she's talked to many many Somalis about the issue, and and none of her patients has ever been involved in doing the actions to their daughters. Like it's, although they may want re but they don't want to do, start cutting to their daughters once they've moved to Italy. So yes, we do need better information on that, I think. And now um, my response to your response, I've derailed perhaps Samira's response to her question. Could we go back to Samira or? 
Okay. Thank you. Please take your uh, mute off, Samira. You're still muted. You have to unmute yourself. There you okay, go. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think that the question about the political, uh, the political role or how, how these politics affect, I think for a long time, um, the government of Sudan, like, you know, almost the last 30 years before the revolution uh, was not very much committed to incriminating FGM. And most of the work that was going on was basically run by civic society and the, the push and the, the power, the influence of the, the, the civic society was to influence the government to engage. And this happened lately uh, through the National Council for Child Welfare, which, which took over the responsibility of the protection of children. But the issue was that most of the discussions and the dialogue and whatever has taken long time was focused on the typology. So we wasted a lot of time, um, um, you know, looking at justifications of uh, which type should continue or should be reduced or should be incriminated or whatever. And at the end of the day, I think because culturally, um, the, the terminology of Sunnah, which is a very religious word, has, has influenced the, even the, the advocacy and um, the movement towards ending FGM, even in non-Islamic communities that do not uh, use Sunnah as a religious word, they are using it culturally for the milder form of cutting, which might be like the clitoridectomy. And uh, this is in most of Africa, uh, many, many tribal groups would say we are doing the Sunnah, even if they are not Muslims. While Sunnah itself is a very Islamic word to mean the prophet's acts or whatever he has approved, uh, yeah. on him, uh, what he has approved, said, or has done. And uh, so this has wasted quite a long time and made a lot of conflict between the religious uh, scholars trying to link FGM to FGM or de-link it from FGM. And actually what happened was that a lot of types came out as a result and many midwives are creating their own sunnah or their own types that should be considered as you know, related to link to religion. And this was like a drawback to the, to the acceleration of change or to, to reach an end to the FGM. But um, after the revolution, the government got very much committed to empowering the women and bring them on board as, you know, and actually this was very effective in one way or another by uh, very quickly incriminating FGM by law, which was not the case before that. Uh, it, it's a good stand, but again, it has to be very well studied uh, that it doesn't fire back by, by uh, that the practice goes underneath and that many girls may be at risk of being cut just for the fear of the law. But now there is a lot of commitment towards legal, um, legal, um, legal reform, a lot of commitment from the government on uh, a new strategy, which has been now designed. Uh, where you get multi, um, multi-dimensional uh, interventions that will help communities, um, you know, survive with with a law, but at the same time changing to uh, communication for for development. This is in terms of politics. Um, also, the new strategy is looking for more commitment by funding from the local local funding from the government, local budgets, not to be donor driven and to have the human resources that have the capacity to, to run the whole program. Uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, COVID, uh, one, uh, a lot of reporting has come out during the, the first uh, round of the, the COVID um, because people were you know, in the lockdown and the uh, programming has also, uh, there was a lot of uh, drawback in the, in the programming um, it seemed that during the COVID uh, um, endemic and until it now, and the first uh, lockdown, there was an increase in, in, in practice FGM, 
even by some groups that were not involved, like the nurses, for instance. Some reports brought that the nurses started to cut. In Sudan, we don't have doctors cutting. Very few, one or two. But the medicalization of the, of the FGM actually was by the introduction of some uh, nurses and the trained midwives, of course. And because of the business uh, recession, I think that during the COVID, it was really adverse to the, to the practice. Um, also the social control, the issue of um, watching dogs from, not watching dogs, but that the communities watch, uh, do, it, do it themselves or engage in watching or how girls should be rescued. At the same time, all of it happened when the girls were coming out on, on vacation. So it took like the first four months where children at home, no busy business, uh, a lot of, and this had a, an adverse impact on, on, on FGM. But now there is a revival and there is a renewed Salima campaign now, which is multimedia. It's going to go now. Uh, I think one of the one of the posters over here in uh, in my profile uh, is one of the Salima renewed uh, campaign, which actually uh, brings uh, uh, talk of people at the community level, giving their own messages about about renewing, you know, the message of Salima and to 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 commit to ending FGM from different parts of the country. So there is a lot of engagement now to get different ethnic groups, different backgrounds, and uh, different modalities of, uh, of working with communities. Uh, so I think there is hope now uh, to have a revival and to have more accelerated work on, on it. I have one point uh, to Dr. Krista. Uh, the issue of um, not only migrants, but we can say people who lived in Europe or in the US and they go back home to cut their daughters. I think this was, the, and this, was, this is an issue of why do migrants, for instance, conform to legal and to, to, to the laws and conform, they abide by the laws when they are outside their home, home origins. And when they come back, they find themselves coming back to the same sociocultural context. This happened at the beginning of uh, when you move from your country and you go outside and the social control uh, is, is less uh, upon you. I think because the smaller, the nuclear families um, create their own, of course, their own communities outside. But because they have a financial and economic power over the home origin, because they send remittances, they are the ones who, uh, they are, they are the ones who look after their families at home. Uh, they have this economic strength. So by the time they abide by the laws in, in the hosting co countries and they become uh, abiding citizens to the law and actually they have this economic power, I think they become also catalysts of change at the homeland. So um, after some years, they become also advocates for change at home. And I think this is very important dynamic that people need to look at, not because they, it's only the economic power, but I think because they become very empowered and at the same time, very confident about leaving the girl Salima, you, you see. And when they come home, they have this strength, they have the empower, this empowerment. And at the same time, they have leverage over their homelands. So they become catalysts of change because they become they, they actually do, do it in their families and become an example. So they become like ambassadors for change. And that's very important to look at because I think that most of the migrants in Europe and, and in the US, as you said, after some time, they start to assimilate and integrate and, and become part of, you know, of abiding to the law. We had a study among the displaced in, from the South, before the South was separated, in Khartoum, when they came and they were not cutting their daughters when they were at, were at home. But to get integrated and to get accepted and to be part of the culture, they started to cut. And in four years, there was a study that showed it has increased, cutting has increased from 4% to 26% among communities that were not used to cutting. 
So I think this is very important, the issue of integration and cross-border and the, the kind of the dynamics between, you know, North, South or Europe and wherever I mean talking about that, you start to integrate and you start to learn, not, not only to learn, but you start to find a better situation for your children that you, you are reducing the harm for them. This happens and gives, gives a chance for a more uh, influence and catalysts of change from the youth who are brought up outside or whatever. And we, we believe that they could be very good. They could have very good initiatives in making even the change at, at their homelands. Now the discussions between the young people on what scenarios they would like their daughters to be in is whether they would leave their daughter Salima or whether they would cut them. This is very important and essential for the for the future of, 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 of discussions among young people. Thank you. Thank you, Samira. That's a very comprehensive answer. And I, I put on my hat that I got in Tutti that that was I thought was so oh. <laughs> indicative of uh, you know, what what Salima's imagery is in Sudan and how important it has been. And um, we had another question uh, from Alawiya Suleiman. I don't know if Krista wants to uh, uh, address the other issue as well, but just let me throw this question in. Um, as Alawiya asked if there has been, if you have found resistance from midwives in the rural areas due to the way that they generate income from continued cutting. In my own experience as an anthropologist, I felt that had greatly reduced and not been a big issue. But those of you who are currently doing research, and perhaps this question could also go to Iqbal Abbas, if uh, she knows of uh, how midwives have been responding to to this issue of the loss of income from that activity as it becomes illegal. So it, uh, who would like to address that? Afaf, did you want to ask Iqbal or Samira, do you want to say something both in Arabic and English so Iqbal will be drawn in or what would you like to do? I think we better give Iqbal a chance and then I can come in if uh, somebody else wants to. Okay. But I, let you, us give Iqbal a chance, but I have also uh, somebody. But, but Samira, would you ask her the question in Arabic then to make sure she understands? Yes, yeah. Iqbal, uh, I'll take the mute off. Iqbal must remove her mute. Tell her to take her mute off. I have the microphone. After Sotik, Sotik, في تغيير وحيحصل تغيير في يعني انخفاض في الطلب عليهم وكده ودورهم كان شنو في العملية بتاعت التغيير آه القابلات بالنسبة لنا في في مبادرة توتي بالذات آه إحنا من الأول يعني قدرنا آه آه نكتسب القابلات ذاتهم يكون جزء من المبادرة وشركاء في المبادرة وبدوا معانا في الشغل بتاع مناهضة ختان الإناث وتوقفوا تماماً عن ختان الإناث فكان لهم دور كبير جداً في التغيير يعني في 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 قابلات في توتي أو هيك أصلاً اثنين واحدة لم تختن أصلاً هي حفيدة لشخ حمد الدمر يوم وما ختنت في حياتها من ما يتعين القابل الثانية تم التغيير وبالعكس بقت هي ذات مجال للتغيير في إنه حتى لو مشوا ليها أسر عايزين يختنوا بيكون دورة إن هي بتعني اللي إنه هي ذاتها تخلت وليه تخلت وبتمشي في طار الهدف الساعي اللي هو كلنا في إنه إعلان تو تخلي من ختان الإناس وبتقدر تقنع حتى الأم أو الحبوبة جابت طفلتها عشان تختنها بإنه هي تخلت عن الختان وبالتالي بتقنع بإنه هي ما تختن بيها يعني ما في قابلات تاني في توتي غير الاثنين ديل؟ لا أصلا في اثنين. So what me to... Could you tell us in English what... Um... Samira, could you 
or Afaf, one of you summarize what Iqbal has just told us? Samira yeah. has frozen up. I don't see her. Oh, well, she was just saying that actually Tuti had only two midwives and one of the midwives um, is a descendant of the same Sheikh Hamad um, and was against uh, FGM and actually um, she was a force of action in, in, in the change that happened in Tuti where the families would come to her and she would um, refuse to do FGM and she would actually um, educate them. So she said that the midwives in Tuti were on board with them and were actually um, very vital and important in impl implementing the, the change in Tuti. Okay, and um, Alawiya, I don't know if that answered your question. If you wanted to unmute yourself and explain it further, you could. But um, that might be something that um, people, uh, maybe maybe Nafisa, since we seem to have lost um, Samira, I don't know if Nafisa, if you're there and here hearing this, you might be familiar with whether that's been a big change in Sudan about whether any midwives are still holding out. Oh, there's Samira again. So. This has been a very technologically challenging sort of webinar, but it's also very exciting to be able to talk to people who are in practice in Sudan as well as in practice in Arizona. And, and Samira, if you could unmute yourself. And, and uh, we heard from Iqbal that there's only two midwives on Tuti, so she did not generalize about the experience of midwives. But Alawiya's question applies to midwives in general in Sudan. Have you still had some who are resisting changing to Salima? Uh, uh, I think the midwives, those who have been um, um, trained, um, you know, on how to, to be part of the community dialogue are not resisting. Why? Because they become facilitators to the community. Yeah. And I think part of the incentives that they, got, they get as facilitators may, um, you know, like, um, compensate them for some of the money that they lose. But That's actually they gain, they gain a good status as community leaders, which is very important because these midwives are very outspoken and they have the leadership potential. And at the same time, they, already, they, are, they are already respected in their communities. So once, once they, they, uh, they are confident to, to be part of the community dialogues and to lead the discussions and to be part of the, of, uh, the decisions, of how to do the undertakings with the communities, it is very hard for them to go back. So I think that at, at that level, they become, because they act as members of communities, not only as midwives who are gaining money and they don't lose, they don't want to lose their membership to the network. This yeah. is one, and I think the second thing is um, um, those who have been trained in the school of midwifery, et cetera, they are already, um, they are already uh, conforming to the oath of midwives after graduation. So they, they take so, this oath not to cut. Those oaths and, and started they, about 15 and, years ago, didn't they? Didn't those oaths begin to be made about 15 no, years no, ago? Yes. Baron, the, what do you mean? When the uh, midwifery schools were asking the graduates to take an oath never to do a circumcision, I remember they started about 15 years ago, but many of them yes. really um, think that it meant all forms until more recently. But I think it's been, I think that's been a strong trend now. Isn't that true? It is now a strong trend that uh, it, it, it is meaning that the meaning is that they don't have to touch the girls or to cut any part of the girls. But because of the issue of typology, as I mentioned, which was earlier, like every midwife would think that she's doing the very milder form and she's not harming the girls. So sometimes they do whatever they think is the, 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 the least, you know, to harm, and then they get the money. But, yeah. but now I think this is, is changing. And um, one, one, because they are part of the institution and the public health law applies to them. The second is, I think, um, now because of the law, the law is going to incriminate the midwives, spe specifically the midwives, not yeah. the families. So maybe, maybe um, it may fire back, but at the same time, I think they may also, now we have some cases in court and um, the issue of, of the law is very 
controversial. For me, at least, I think it's controversial because I don't think we have reached the state of where everybody abides by the law in Sudan. It's not like that. Okay. We are not all abiders by the law. And some people would like to uh, even not conform by the laws and not abide by the law just for the sake of, uh, you know, just, just like that, you know, they don't like to abide by the law. So you can do it, um, hide, um, it can do, it can be done uh, in very different, and that's, I think, needs a study after the law, what happens. Now there is a roadmap of applying the law, and I think part of it is how to smoothly bring on board all the medical and health care providers to be part of this roadmap. Yes, as we, and, talked, uh, about, as we talked about last time, it, it's, yes. a law is not the answer, but it is a tool that can be used as part right. of the social movement. And um, I, I wanted to point out, if any of you want to look in the chat, the link for that TED talk is now in the chat. And if you wanted to cut and paste it into your own sources for later, that would be a good suggestion. And I know we're going to begin to lose some of our audience. Um, so before we do, I just wanted to ask, it, did uh, Krista, did you have anything else you wanted to say um, in response to any of the discussion? No, if not, um, if anyone else has a question, would you either raise your hand or unmute yourself? And if not, I think we all ought to thank our panelists, Mama Iqbal and Dr. Krista and Dr. Samira and um, our presenters. I'm, I, I'm very pleased to see that we had um, we had so many international guests with us today from Germany, Italy, Sudan, and did, uh, uh, maybe some of the students from Ghana were here too, I don't know. But we had one <laughs> student from Ghana. Exactly. So we have, and we have East Coast, West Coast. So this, I, I'm really delighted that Sama has made this possible. And I'd like us all to have a, a round of applause for each other. If, if not, uh, you know, I'll, I'll applause with sound to the rest of you might be sound free, but um, <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, is there anything that uh, Afaf or Nahla was going to say at the end, or are we finished? With Thank that? you, Ellen. Thank you, Ellen. I think it was a very enriching discussion, and um, I wish we had more time. I think you know, if we keep talking, we're gonna talk for hours. It's a, a complex issue that. Um, is very interesting. So thank you, our panelists. We um, appreciate your presence and um, hopefully we can do more of this in the future. Shukran Mama Iqbal. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for and well, mabruk ala, 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 the, the award that she got. What is it called? It, this is a very good congratulations for her. Mabruk. Yeah, video The video is I don't know the do we have the link for the video? We could yeah, uh, we can put the video on. Um Nahla, do you have it? Mm. Um there's a very short video about the the experience of Iqbal on Tuti. And I hope we had hoped to be able to show it. Ah, here it is. Go ahead and play it. It's let's see. Uh, فكرة عندنا عدد من الناس كافي فبعد ممكن نبدأ ونستعرض ال strategic plan بتاع سامة من ضمن البرنامج. Oh, there's to the island. Ah. Yuban Muhammad Abbas. رئيس جمعية أصدقاء الأسرة والطفل أمين عام مبادرة توتي خالية من كتان الإناث بدينا برامج بتاع التواصل أسري عبر صديقات المدارس ورياض الأطفال في المدارس وفي رياض الأطفال برنامج التواصل الأسري ده عبارة عن لما بتاعت ونسا مع الأمهات في الروضة أو مع الأمهات في المدارس بنقعد وبنتفاكر في إنه إحنا عايزين نناهض عادات ضارة بأطفالنا من, من الضمن بنركز عليه 
عدد ختان الإناث بأنها ضارة بصحة الطفلة وما في جوانب بتجبرنا إحنا نأذي طفلاتنا الفين وتزعة أعلننا المشروع الفكرة أعلننا الفكرة كمشروع في الفين وتزعة بدينا بأنه عملنا مسح ميداني بدعم من صندوق الأمم المتحدة للسكان عشان نجيب على الوضع الراهن ونحن بنعمل في المسح الميداني في مجتمع توتي اكتشفنا إنه في 18 حبوبة من خلال المسح ومهضات لختان الإناس من حفيدات الشيخ حمد الدمريوم ودناهم معنا في المبادرة وغاد معنا لجنة من الحبوبات بيقوموا بقعدات القهوة جلسة الجبنة ويناقشوا فيها بنات وأحفاد أو حفيدات لأنه هم كحبوبات ضد ختان بنات وضد ختان حفيدات سميناهم حبوبات سمعت البنات وبقينا نقود بيون جلسات الحوار المجتمعي والحراك المجتمعي في بيوت المناسبات وجلسات حوار الأجيال مع الشباب يقعدوا مع الشابات يقعدوا ويتحاوروا ويتناغشوا ويطلعوا بمجموعات إضافية للمبادرة فبقت في مجموعة من المبادرين من مجتمع توتي هم مؤمنين تماما بانه نحقق هدف مشروع توتي خالية من ختان الاناث وبدينا في توعية وبناء قدرات الشباب الكادر الصحي كوننا مجموعات من النساء والمعلمات والناشطين ورجال الدين في حماية المجتمع سميناه لجان الحماية لجان الحماية ده كان دور كبير جدا في انه نحن نحقق هدف توت خالي من ختان الناس كان عندهم دور كبير في انه بمجرد ما اللجنة في الحي يسمعوا بانه في ام او حبوبة نوت على ختان بيتها طوال يشيلوا قهوتهم ويمشوا يقعدوا معاها او يدعوها معاهم في جلسة قهوة ويبقى في حوار قاعد فيه رجل الدين قاعدة فيه البحث الاجتماعية قاعدة فيه ممثلة من الكادر الصحي إذا كانت طبيبة أو داية أو خلافه ويبتدوا يتحاوروا في المحاور اللي بتخص الزول اللي عايزة تختم دي هي دارة تختم ليه بيبتدي الحوار يكون في المجال بتاع إنه الناس كلها بتتحاور على إنه تقنع فبيكون ده حوار جلسة بتاعت حوار مجتمعي كثير جدا المستهدفة في الحوار دي بتطلع من الجلسة وهي مقتنعة وبعد كم يوم من الجاهزات عملت لنا جلسة قهوة في منطقة حولها وجابت الحولها وابتدت تتكلم معاهم في انه هي حضرت جلسة والجلسة دي هي اقتنعت منها كيف وبتقنع غيرها قدرنا نصل لإقناع المجتمع بالحوار المجتمعي وباستهداف المجتمع نفسه في العمل في التخلي والاهتمام بالقضية كمجتمع شيخ خلف الله من كبار رجال الدين في توتي شيخ خلف الله عمر استغلينا عهد نحن أبناء الشيخ حمد الدمريوم تعهدنا بأن نعلن توتي خالية من ختان الإناث ودي كانت يعني كل من ينطق بها خلاص آمن بها تماما فإحنا الآن ما في أي ختان حتى الوافدين اللي لسه ما اقتنعوا بكده إحنا فخورين بأنه خدمنا مجتمع بالمجتمع نفسه وأعلمنا توتي خالي من ختان That was beautiful. Thank you so much, Iqbal. 
all the comments in the chat are saying what a wonderful woman this is. And uh, so we are all so proud of you. Yeah, Sheikh Shukran Jazeelan, thank you so much. And so all of our friends who are still here, thank you for sticking around and getting to see this. Um, does anyone have anything more to say or shall we? Uh, yes, I would like to invite everyone to join SAUDA, Sudanese American Women Association and <laughs> support women. Please join us. <laughs> Okay, and everyone should join SAMA as well because SAMA has a work has room for affiliate members like me who are not doctors. I can also join that too. We are welcoming everyone, not not only doctors. Every okay. woman welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you to all of you who participated. It's wonderful to see Krista and Samira. Um,